Today's episode of Lions of Liberty is brought to you by MathBot.com. MathBot.com is a fun little game that fills a serious hole that the public and even the private schools miss, and that is knowledge of programming and the math behind programming. MathBot.com gives parents a much-needed tool to make sure their children don't fall behind in this new information age. Software is eating the world, and those who don't know how to code will be left behind as more and more jobs become automated. MathBot.com gives kids and even adults like me, the knowledge needed to thrive in this new world. MathBot may just seem like a fun and simple game, but behind the scenes, it uses the same method Julius Caesar, Isaac Newton, Einstein, and everyone else were all taught math before the state got its greasy hands into education. This method goes all the way back to classical Greece, the dawn of civilization. MathBot will gradually upload the math and logical skills needed to understand programming into the mind of any player. It's said that the pen is mightier than the sword, but now code is even mightier than the pen. So become mighty and learn to code over at mathbot.com. Welcome to the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here's your host, your guide, your shining beacon of liberty, Mark Clare. What's up, friends, and welcome back to the flagship Lions of Liberty podcast, where you are graced with my vocal cords every single Monday, and when I attempt to have great conversations about the ideas of liberty. I don't just attempt, I do it, gosh darn it, and that's why you're still here, 395 episodes later. That's right, this is the episode 395 of this very podcast. That means you can find today's show notes over at lionsofliberty.com slash 395. As you listen to this, I am currently traipsing about in New York City with a gentleman who goes by the name, at least on this podcast, he goes by the name of Rico. You know him from the Liberty Draft. You know him from many libertarians in living rooms drinking liquor roundtables, which I and my fellow podcast hosts also conduct uh, on this new format that we're doing. We're incorporating that format, that roundtable, laid-back format into all our programs, and uh, it's been a big hit so far. So I hope you guys are enjoying that, getting to hear more of our our extended family of characters like Rico, like Howie, like JB, all of whom will be with us at Porkfest at the end of June. Do, 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 please get your tickets to Porkfest over at Porkfest.com and join us there. It's going to be a great time. I'm going to be part of a podcasting panel there, and we are going to be doing several different podcasting events, live podcasts, as well as hosting a beer pond tournament. So we are really going to have a blast with those of you who are able to make it up to Porkfest to hang with your favorite libertarian variety show your friends here at lions of liberty and of course it's not just me we've also got brian on wednesdays bringing you his weekly shot of comedy culture and liberty on electric liberty land and you get john odie odermatt wrapping things up every friday with his hard-hitting and inspiring look at the broken criminal justice system on felony friday three shows for the price of one and that price is free unless of course you are a member of the lions of liberty pride one of our many supporters on patreon in which case you do pay us some money as little as five dollars a month but you also get a ton of extra bonus audio and video content so be sure to check that out over at patreon.com slash lions of liberty and if you don't want to support us on patreon if you don't want to send us money every month for whatever reason no hard feelings but maybe just maybe you want to try a bag of our brand new coffee the morning roar coffee by anarcho coffee and lions of liberty we have partnered together for a great new coffee blend there's really no better way to start your day than by roaring with the lions of liberty so head over to lionsofliberty.com slash coffee for a very special offer on your first purchase you can also get a bigger discount by joining the aforementioned lions of liberty pride i'm really excited to bring you my conversation today we had this conversation a few weeks ago i had to push the interview back because of a few things that came up uh something like a certain congressman uh, congressman justin amash who i was able to schedule. So I had to wedge him in here and uh, we did have to push the interview around a little bit, but I am very excited to bring you my interview today. You will hear a few slightly dated references, uh, particularly as it relates to Beto O'Rourke and his pending announcement of running for president. He is obviously now officially running for president. So anything that you hear that is a little bit out of sync timeline wise, now you know why, but I am very excited still to bring you today's guest. <laughs> All right, my guest today is the host of another Libertarian podcast, a podcast known as the Jen the Libertarian podcast. Her name is Jen. She is a Libertarian. She is Jen the Libertarian. Jen, are you ready to roar? Hell yeah, let's do this. 
All right. I think that's the most time I've ever said the word Jen in one sentence <laughs> <laughs> introducing you. <laughs> now, Jen, uh, as you know, as it states in the podcast title, you are a libertarian. You are a gender libertarian. So how did you go from normal Jen? I imagine at some point you were not a libertarian in your life. How did you go from normal Jen to becoming to morphing into Jen the libertarian? Well, see, that's the thing. I think I always was, but I didn't know Ooh. that libertarian was a thing until Ron Paul came around. Right. Yeah, I was really active in his first campaign, and I didn't – like, I was raised Republican. I was raised very anti-war Republican. I know that sounds like an oxymoron now, but my mom was of an age where she knew guys back in high school and then, like, after graduation who got drafted into Vietnam and they did not come home. That'll make you anti-war. Yeah, so very anti-war, very, you know, fiscally responsible, very Republican. Democrat is still a dirty word in that household. But I was always that kind of strain of Republican. And so I just always identified as Republican. And then Ron Paul came around. And I'm like, oh, what's what's a libertarian? Oh, wait, these are my people. I found my people. They're over here. It's that light bulb moment. And almost everyone I interview at some point has the moment where maybe they've been thinking these ideas. They've they sort of had an inclination to them. But there's always that one moment where the light bulb really goes off. And not only do you realize there is a, a cohesive philosophy out there that describes what you believe, but there's actually others. There, there's not just you that thinks this stuff. There's other people out there. And that's, you know, to me, that was what really got me excited and made me a lot more bold in speaking out when I realized it's not just me sitting here, you know, reading books and, and thinking about libertarian ideas there's actually other people out there doing it too who are also passionate about it so why don't i join the fun and here we are yeah it's fascinating i'm always interested because it always seems to me like whenever you ask somebody that question like how did you become a libertarian it always seems like 80 to 90 percent of the people that answer that question came like from the left over to libertarianism and that is fascinating to me i'm like do you think it's that high is that high for you i don't know it always seems to be and it's like for me it was like I, I was already in the neighborhood. I was already on the street. I just went a couple houses down. Right. And a lot of these people seem to have come from like a subdivision that was like across town and you came all this way over here. And it's like, that's fascinating to me. You moved here from some other place. I don't even, you know, I never even heard of before. Yeah. Like where, where'd you come from? Like I was just over there and now I'm over here. Cause I didn't know over here existed until just right now. So, but yeah, so that's how that started. And obviously, so that was about, a little over 10 years ago now, and that's pretty much where I've been. And how long did it take you? I mean, you said you were pretty involved actively in the campaign. So were you involved in like speaking about politics, speaking about your views in your day to day life? I mean, did you start talking about this stuff with your friends, your family? I mean, that's when that's when the, the change came for me, when it came when it when I stopped just talking to my closest circle and talking to like everybody I ran into about this stuff. Um, Like. I'm trying to think of the best way to say this because I don't really actually talk about politics too much in my day-to-day -day life because I spend so much time doing it in other venues. Right. It's kind of like a nice relief to talk to people about other things. But I mean, I don't really make it a secret of my political affiliation or my thoughts or anything like that. So it was kind of one of those things. Like I said, it was just like finding my people. It's like I thought my people were over here in the Republican Party, but then I found out that libertarians existed. And I'm like, oh, okay, this thing that I am has a name. And I just didn't know the name until Ron Paul. And now we're in a little club and we can all meet and have coffee and talk about these wacky ideas. And just be on each other's podcast for forever and ever and ever. <laughs> right. Now, when did you actually decide to take that shift uh, from whatever you know circles, libertarian circles you were just in, whether it's online, in person, what have you, and actually start your own podcast and really put your own voice out there uh, in an even more public way? Well, actually, it's funny you ask because March 14th will be my one year podcast anniversary. Congratulations. Thank you. And before that, I had started making YouTube videos and I stopped making YouTube videos for a couple different reasons, um, mainly because it's just it's way easier to do audio than it is to do video. So much easier. And it's I, think <laughs> I basically it's, press record and talk. Oh, um, you know, yes. As it, you know, a little more complicated than that at times. And you don't have to worry about lighting and you don't have to worry about your makeup and you don't have to worry about your clothes. And it's like it's just it's just way, way easier to do than video. But also YouTube is not really the most friendly place in the world to be doing videos right now and even even a year ago and even far past that. It's it's kind of a, a weird 
sort of place, I think, to try to build that kind of platform. So I kind of pivoted to podcasting and I decided I just, I really like this format. I like doing this. This works out well for me. So I've just kept doing it for the past year and here we are. Like, I can't believe it's, it's about to be a year. Like, it doesn't feel like it's almost been a year. Yeah, it's wild. I mean, it's been over five years now since I started oh it. And I, I, I still sort of have that. I think we all have it to an extent. I still sort of have that imposter syndrome where I, I still feel like I'm just learning to podcast, even though I've been doing it for this long and seems seem to have a general idea of what I'm doing. But I think we all have a certain sense of that, maybe a certain sense of humility that uh, we're kind of faking it in a, in a way. But when you really think about it, everyone out there is faking it. So, you know, it's just about how much, how well you can do it. Yeah. And it's always like that weird, that weird moment where you see that somebody has like listened to your podcast and they retweet something that you like you tweeted out about your podcast and someone retweets it and you're like wait a minute does this person listen to me wait um hold <laughs> on wait, wait a by accident and like you want to ask but you don't like want to ask <laughs> Were you super obsessed with the numbers, the download numbers when it first started? I was extremely obsessed with download numbers when I first started, but now I barely even, you know, I, I glance at them once in a while. We need to know what they are for, for business purposes, but I, I, I found myself caring less and less about numbers and, and focusing more and more on just doing good content as I've gone along, but I know it's not the same for everybody. I'm not going to lie. I am I am totally a, a stats ho. I, I re- <laughs> the first 24 hours, if I am awake, I'm refreshing it. I like, I don't care. Like, I know you're not supposed to judge your numbers until like a month after an episode's out, but I'm like, no, I I'm, I'm refreshing this like, like all day because I, I need validation. <laughs> I want to know people like me and I want to know right now. Well, it's interesting too. I think, especially like my little metric that I figured out, and this is completely unscientific and can be completely wrong. So please don't go off this people. But I think your downloads in like the first 24 hours is a good idea of how many subscribers you actually have. Well, that seems fair since you know, so many people have, when you're when they're literally have hit that subscribe button, most of them, or at least a large majority of people have that auto download set. So it is it is at least giving you a good idea of who your, maybe your truest fans are, or the subscribers that are actually checking you out when your show drops, as opposed to people that, you know, they might check it out here and there or catch an episode, depending on the title. You know, you got, it's hard to try to sort that out through the limited podcasting numbers we have. Yeah, because it's not like YouTube or Twitter or Instagram or anything else where you can really see like hard stats of like how many people follow you, who's liking your content, who's sharing your content. Like when you put out a podcast, it's kind of nebulous. So you kind of got to try to figure out your own backwards way of trying to figure out like, okay, how many people do I have subscribing to me? Like how fast do I make it to this particular number? And then that's kind of really the only metric you have on podcasting, which kind of sucks compared to other platforms, but I mean, it is what it is. Yeah, I, I forget where I heard this once, but I always think just look at those numbers, whatever they may be, and imagine you yourself sitting in a room talking to that many people. So even if it's like 40 people, it's still like, oh, wow, if you actually pictured yourself in a room with 40 people intently listening to you, even that would be pretty cool. I mean, I've, I don't think I've been in many rooms where 40 people were even listening to me at once in real life. And I guess that's what the amazing thing about podcasting is just the ability to reach people that we just never would have any other way. Yeah, and it is kind of cool. And it's even when you're first starting, like, even if you have like little tiny numbers, it's still like, oh my God, these people are like listening to me. Even if it's like 25 people or 50 people or however many people, it's like, these people have chosen to listen to me. And that's, that's wild. Like, I can't imagine not ever being like amazed by that. Hey friends, I got to take a quick pause here to tell you about another great libertarian podcast out there. It's called Free Man Beyond the Wall, hosted by the artist formerly known as Mance Raider, now known simply by his real name of Pete Raymond. And I got to tell you, Pete is a machine. This guy brings you a new episode of his own every single Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and he has done some absolutely fantastic in-depth interviews. He's had on everybody from Ron Paul to Thaddeus Russell to Phil Labonte, the lead singer of All That Remains, a very diverse group of guests not always libertarians. He also did a great show with a Washington, D.C. 
insider lobbyist revealing a lot of the dirt that goes on behind the scenes in DC. He has done so many interviews that I have just said, darn, I wish I did this one myself. So I really do want to highly recommend checking out Freeman Beyond the Wall. You can find it over at freemanbeyondthewall.com as well as iTunes, Stitcher, and all those fancy podcatchers out there. So what what are some of the biggest challenges that you found, um, you know, starting your own podcast? I, I guess from scratch. I don't know if you had, you know, audio experience or broadcasting experience or anything like that before. Uh, I certainly did it, not not in the audio end anyway. So what are some of the biggest challenges that you've found, um, you know, kind of becoming a podcaster from scratch, so to speak? Um, I'd say probably when you're first starting out, your hardest thing is audio. But then again, I think that when you're first starting out with anything, I mean, obviously you're probably starting out with limited funds. So I think, and again, this is one of those ones that's like, this is why audio is better than video. It's much easier to get better audio on a cheaper budget than it is to get good video on a cheap budget. So, I mean, sure. you can invest, like my first mic that I ever started recording on was actually a Yeti Snowball, which I think I paid like 60 or $70 for. And Obviously, the rig that I have now, I share it with my husband, and it, it costs a lot more than 60 or $70. But I mean, it's one of those ones where it's like, you don't really need a lot of money up front. You just have to like sit down and start doing it, and you have to learn as you go. Like, There's plenty of tips that people can give you, but you don't really learn what works out best for you as far as like your content, your length, your scheduling, just all of that until you sit down and start doing it. So. I would say probably the the hardest thing when you're first starting is to be kind of gentle with yourself and not be quite so hard on yourself because it's the first time you're doing something. And it's probably not going to be super duper great, but you, you just got to start doing it and then you'll get better as you do it. And yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Well, you mentioned your husband there, and uh, for those not in the know, you are married to uh, the man formerly known as Mance Raider, the host of the Free Man Beyond the Wall podcast, our friend Pete Raymond. And I I'm kind of curious, did you guys, uh, I mean, how did you become a libertarian couple? Did one of you make the other into a libertarian, or did you just, just sort of both meet uh, in those circles? How did that all Oh, uh, God, up? no, we've been together, <laughs> gosh, so long that I don't even remember how many years. Um, <laughs> we've been married, I think. <laughs> Do not quote me on this because I am so bad with dates. I think it will be 13 years this year that we've been married. And then we were together for about four and a half years before that. So, so even before the Ron Paul moments and, and the, the current wave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been together for a long, 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 long time. So that's kind of how that happened. So we met way before any any of this, any of this. So we kind of both came to it in the same way at the same time. I mean, it wasn't like one of us converted the other. It's just, obviously we both kind of had the same belief systems before. And so right. it was like, it's just, just finding out like, okay, this is where we belong. And then he took it and kind of ran with it in different ways than I did. And I know a lot of people have mentioned that we kind of have different tones and it's not, I think that's safe to say. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, but, and it's not like a conscious thing. It's just like we're two different people. So, but yeah, we, we've known each other and we've been together for, for freaking ages now. So it was way before any of this. So did you both, I, I believe he started a po the podcast before you, but I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. I believe he did though. Um, so did you, did, did his starting the podcast like inspire you or did you both sort of independently decide that you wanted to get into this thing? How did that all work itself out? Well, he started, and we were just talking about this the other night. His is about a year and a half old now, maybe a tick more than that. And he had started doing his podcast a little bit before I started doing my original YouTube videos. And then I pivoted to podcasting because, like I said, it was just, it was easier to do. It was just a lot less money. It was a lot less time. And I kind of had him hit there to kind of help me launch it, not in a way of like promoting me, but just like showing me like, okay, you push this button and you do this thing. <laughs> right. And then the, the sounds go into the computer and then you edit them. So <laughs> it is helpful to have someone sort of hold your hands through the very basics. Yeah. And I mean, obviously he's always been like super supportive of this and he's never, he, he's never had a bad word to say about it, obviously. And he, he has supported me a lot in this. So there, there is that, but it was also kind of like an individual decision on my own that like, okay, yeah, I want to try to do this thing. 
So I'm curious. I don't know how much you guys talk libertarianism in your sort of, you know, sort of off time, I guess, because if you spend so much time on it, he spends so much time on it. I imagine there's probably a lot of times you just want to, you know, watch Game of Thrones or something and not, not really talk about this stuff. But I'm curious, when you do have these discussions, as I'm sure you do from time to time, are there any areas uh, within libertarianism that you and your husband, you know, don't see eye to eye on or have disagreed upon? Or is it all just hunky dory and, and agreeing on everything there is a couple of issues that we don't entirely see eye to eye on and that's kind of between us but (laughs) yeah yeah. you don't have to uh, call them out here publicly (laughs) yeah conversations (laughs) as much as i like to spark controversy (laughs) conversations in our house are either really erudite or really dumb like there's no middle ground it's like either really high-minded like high concept stuff or like dick and fart jokes that's all we got going on in our house (laughs) That's not a bad, you know. That's not a bad set of uh, dichotomies there. I gotta say, that's pre- that pretty much describes most of my conversations with people as well. Well, I mean, you gotta you gotta have somebody that you can just have like normal conversations with. Like it can't be all politics all the time. Because, like I said, I do this, he does this, we we do this so much that it's like sometimes you just want to talk about things that don't revolve around this. So uh, as we all know, um, you know, M- M- Pete used to go by the name Mance Raymond. You on Twitter used to just go by Jen the Libertarian. You recently changed your Twitter handle to Jen Monroe, which I know isn't exactly your full legal name. But what is behind the thought process? I know what went behind, you know, what Pete's changed. But are, are, have both of you sort of made a conscious effort to, uh, I guess, maybe be a little less, um, maybe a little more public in your actual beliefs, or what's really behind? But what? what, what, what oh, sorry. What are your general thoughts? Well, on I that? decided that i mean and this was an idea that i was playing around with for a little while of kind of being a little more public with who i actually am like my real name and i was talking to him about it one day and this is going to sound nihilistic as hell but this is this is the story so i was telling him that i was thinking about you know trying to go by my real name and he pointed out that if you searched a certain search in google and i'm not going to tell you guys the words that you need to put into google oh to find out this, this is going to be really fun to try to figure out <laughs> but if you searched his name that not only could you find his information you could find my name too so at that uh-huh. point it's just kind of like well screw it i mean if somebody wants to find it out they can find it out relatively easily so it's just like you know what whatever let's let's do this because i mean I think at some point when you make a decision and this is, this is probably going to sound really bad, but anyway, once you make a decision that you want to pursue something in a certain way, you kind of have to put yourself out there more so than you would if like you were just trying to remain anonymous and just trying to not really take anything to the next level or anything. So at some point, like even when you do start posting things somewhat anonymously, like either your real name is going to come out or you're going to have to out yourself just in order to gain like a little more credibility, I guess would be the best way to explain right. that. Right. I mean, you're either going to remain sort of anonymous and, you know, you might build a, a small niche circle, but if you're really going to end up making impact at some point, you're going to have to basically reveal who you are anyway, or people will try to find out and it won't be that hard. You know, it's not like you're going through uh, encryption through, through changing a Twitter handle. People can, people can find this stuff out. So at some point, if you really want this to be your thing, if you really want to speak out about this stuff, you do basically have to just tell the world. Yeah, who you and I are. think it's just, it's easier if you just do it yourself versus having somebody do it to you. Yeah. And at least sure. then you have a little more control over how it happens. I, I, at the same time, I mean, I do understand the hesitancy to reveal yourself publicly, especially nowadays when so many people get slammed for things they've said on the internet. You have groups of people who will actively try to get people fired from their jobs for things they've said politically or things they've tweeted eight years ago. Uh, it's really a scary culture that I think in many ways social media and Twitter is, is helping to foster of – it's almost like a doxing culture. It's like we just have to out everybody for anything they've ever said and any of their views and and not just disagree with them, but actively attempt to ruin their lives. It's it's a it's a very scary phenomenon. That it I'm really saying. is. And it was like I'd been thinking about it for probably a couple of months before I actually did it. And then like every time I was ready to do it, like one of those stories would come out where somebody got doxxed and just horrible things happened to them. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, do I really want to do this? And then it was just like, 
finally it's like, you know what? It just do it. It's going to be whatever it's going to be. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of ugliness on social media. And I know I talk about it a lot on my podcast, but it's just, I mean, again, it goes back to that idea that if somebody wants to find out who you are, they're going to find out who you are. So, I mean, you might as well just, I mean, be damned as a goat versus damned as a sheep. What do you think about Twitter and Facebook and these social media platforms? Because it does seem to me there has been a marked difference in political dialogue today than even, say, 10 years ago. Because it seemed like in the 2000s, we just disagreed with each other. People just disagreed and had discussions. And maybe I'm just remembering things in a more flowerful, lovely way than they really were. But now it seems it's it's a rare occasion when I find somebody and I'm bracing for a reaction nowadays when I disagree with somebody about something, whether it's on social media or real life. But I think social media is playing a, a major part in, in what's signaling our brains to act this way, where now if you disagree, it's because you are part of another tribe that is evil and trying to destroy humanity and and therefore you must not be spoken to or talked to. And that's, again, just a very dangerous trend because when we stop talking to each other and start seeing each other as, as parts of tribes who are at war with each other, well, then you're just going to end up literally at war with each other at some point when we're not using our voice, we're using our fists and our guns, et cetera. Yeah, and that's something I've been thinking about a lot lately because I actually, despite all of the BS that happens on Twitter, I still view Twitter as a good thing. Like, I would not be happy if it was gone tomorrow. There's still a lot of good things that happen on social media, and I still tend to be a social media optimist despite everything. D- despite everything my head tells me, my heart is still a social media optimist. But I do think that you have a point, and lots of other people do too, in that the viciousness of things is starting to ramp up. And I think there's a lot of different reasons for that. I think it's a lot easier when you're on social media or when you're attacking somebody on the internet to attack somebody because you don't see them. Like they're not a real person to you. And the moment that somebody becomes a real person to you, it makes it a lot harder to attack somebody on just nonsense. Like that's normally what people get attacked on now. It's just complete nonsense stuff. Like, and I, I guess we can go ahead and talk about the current Tucker Carlson situation. I don't know. Oh, certainly. Like, okay. So he said things that, were not very great, to be completely honest. They, they, he said some things that were pretty awful. But this was on. Well, what's what's the worst one that you've actually heard? Because I, I mean, I've only I've seen a few headlines and read a few articles. Some of them seem like nonsense, and some of them seem like okay, maybe well, that's kind of weird. Media Matters, <laughs> who started this whole thing, is doing one of these little like drip, drip, drip campaigns where it's like every day you want to like put uh. something new out there. And I mean, there were a couple of instances. And again, for those of you who don't know. Tucker was calling into Bubba the Love Sponge's show, which if you do not know who Bubba the Love Sponge is, just avoid it, please. Don't. It's pretty much the definition of shock. Yeah, save yourselves. Like, only not very funny. (laughs) Howard Stern spawned this whole, like, generation of imitators that were never quite as good as him, and he's one of them. But Tucker was calling into his show for reasons I do not understand. Like, why were you even doing this in the first place? But I mean, he was. He was talking about people using the C word, which I will not repeat on your show. And you wouldn't you wouldn't be the first if you did. Well, I, mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, plus, I just I don't particularly like using that word anyway. But I mean, just saying things about women and the the Warren Jeff situation of trying to kind of defend Warren Jeff and what he was doing as far as his the the Mormon the the what what was that sect of Mormonism called? The, the really strict one. I'm actually that not familiar with married off like, like like 13 year olds to adults and stuff like that. Oh, the uh, the the um, Church of Jesus there Christ of Latter Day Saints. Is that I it? couldn't remember. Yeah. What. See, I do know things. <laughs> but yeah, and just defending that and just saying various. Because he was convicted of, um, I guess, child like sexual yeah. abuse, right? Because of, I guess, yeah, um, because religious views he held about uh, the age it was appropriate to be with. Yeah, because he was the leader of that particular sect, and I guess he was performing the ceremonies, marrying these people. Anyway, but just very stuff like that. I mean, he says some stuff about Iraqis. He says some stuff about that that one really dumb Miss Teen USA that gave that one really dumb answer a bunch of years back that nobody even remembers anymore. Right. But I mean, the whole point is like this was stuff from ten years ago. 
on on some shock jocks radio show and nobody said boo about it 10 years ago but now all of a sudden you want to make a big deal out of this because you don't like tucker carlson like this makes no sense to me like who cares it's a really scary thought that we can't allow people to change their views and their style and the way they would say things especially as the culture changes uh the things that he was saying might not have sounded nearly as bad 10 years ago as they do now um to ears that are have been influenced by the way our culture has changed in many ways and our culture continues to change. And I don't really want to live in a world where you can't evolve with the times and you can't evolve your views. And, you know, I mean, if I heard stuff I said 10 years ago, I'd probably think I sounded like a lunatic. I mean, we literally change so much as people as time goes on that it's very scary that there's a culture out there of just people picking through everybody's past and we're putting especially now when we're putting our past out there so much uh knock on wood uh, through podcasts and, and that sort of thing i mean who, who knows some of the audio that, that's floating around there with me probably nothing nothing like tucker said but you know it, it's, it's a really frightening again a frightening phenomenon that people want to dig through the past and see what the worst thing they could find a person had ever said or held as a belief instead of actually trying to see who that person is now and what their beliefs are now i mean there's a million things i disagree with tucker Car- carlson about but he's pretty much one of the only anti-war voices if not the only one on the right that's of any media prominence on Fox News Uh, and he's been pretty solidly anti-war so to me yeah maybe he said some bad stuff 10 years ago but the fact that he's actively campaigning against mass death throughout the world you know buys him a few bonus points with me and maybe we should look at that more so than some silly nasty things he might have said on on a a stupid shock jock show 10 years ago and that's the anti-war thing is really the only thing buying him points with me right now because I have yeah, that's about the other I have one. Plenty of things to say about <laughs> the other one. things that he's had to say lately, but my my thought is, and I was just thinking about this while you were talking about it, is that we're finally like in a phase where you can go back ten years and you can hear somebody's recordings, or you can read their tweets, or you can see something they posted on Facebook. Like, like the technology has evolved so far that we actually have that far back of archives to go into, to start looking into somebody's past, which is ridiculous in and of itself. I mean, like, I don't, I don't care what anybody said 10 years ago. Like, I don't, who cares? It was 10 years ago, but it's kind of dangerous in that way, because especially 10 years ago, nobody really thought that we would be here. Like nobody, I don't think anybody, tweeting back in 2007 2008 2009 or being on podcasts or being on somebody's radio show ever really thought that it would evolve to where we're at right now where like all of this stuff is searchable like you can find anything that anybody said at any point in the past i'd say 11 12 years so it's it's a really weird time we live in and i'm i just look at it like okay Somebody says something 10 years ago. I I don't care. What did somebody say like last week? Like what what's right. interesting to me is throughout this whole Tucker Carlson, oh, he said he said some things on Bubba the Love Sponge 10 years ago. Okay. And I'm probably going to butcher this woman's name, but Janine Pirro, the the other girl at Fox I believe News, that's how it's pronounced. Yeah, she she had made a comment about Ilhan Ilhan Omar and her hijab. And that she that her wearing the hijab means that she doesn't support the Constitution. Like, um, no, she's exercising her 1A rights. But like, this is somebody who just said this like last week and it's cricket. These seem like very unrelated things. <laughs> what what you're wearing on your head and uh, if what? you, you know, if you uh, are for or against the yeah, Constitution. Yeah, like, okay, this woman practicing her freedom of religion is apparently against the Constitution? Well, she may be in many areas, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure if I read her whole platform, I, I would probably think she is against it in many ways, but not in this particular circumstance. Yeah, that, that's a weird conflation to make, but it's... Yeah, just I don't I'm not okay with this digging into people's past and pulling up all this just old shit. Like it makes no sense to me. Like I don't I don't care what somebody said ten years ago. What does that have to do with that? Plus my God, we're we're all saying enough current shit to, to yeah, focus like, on. What? I don't like, do we really have time to even look at the old like, stuff? People are saying things like right now. And that's 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 kinda how I feel about a lot of different movements that are going on right now, is that why 
Like, is nobody doing anything right now that you could possibly be litigating? We ha- we have to go back 10, 20, 30 years. Like, what about right now? Is is there anybody doing anything right now that we need to be talking about? Well, well let's talk a little bit more about right now, because right now what I'm seeing all around me is uh, quite possibly a conflation of events uh, that will uh, either make my life really, really entertaining or completely ruin it with how many podcasts I have to dedicate to it. But that is, of course, the 2020 Democratic presidential race. And uh, I know this is something you've been following in many ways. And there's a, a few interesting candidates in the sense that I see libertarians talking about a couple candidates, uh, in particular Tulsi Gabbard and uh, this fellow Andrew Yang. <laughs> but uh, I don't want to talk about them just yet. Who I want to talk about is someone I saw you tweeting about and uh, earlier today, actually. And I I, I cannot figure this person out or where they came from or why they exist or why they are being pushed as the next big thing. And that is this Beto or Beto or Beto <laughs> we discussed before the show. None of us are still sure how to pronounce his name. But what is up with this guy? Where, where, is the, where did this guy come from and why is he supposed to be anything? Because as far as I know, his entire resume is I lost a Senate race to Ted Cruz. <laughs> so I'm really trying to wrap my head around why this guy is being pushed on the uh, American public so hard. There's articles everywhere. Uh, he's got this. Apparently, this guy can afford to just take off and drive around the country for four months and make a documentary about how sad he is that he lost a Senate race. Uh, what's going on here, Jen? <laughs> okay, so the only thing I could figure, like, as and I might butcher this. So anybody who wants to tell me I'm wrong, feel free. I think before he was running against Cruz, he was mayor of El Paso. So he's had a little bit of a local political career. And then obviously, I think he got a lot of media shine because he was running against Ted Cruz. And it was a close race. And a lot of people started boosting him up because they wanted to get rid of Ted Cruz. And there was a lot of, from what I understand from people who actually live in Texas and were on the ground there versus national media coverage, he was much bigger nationally than he was actually in Texas. But they kind of latched onto him for reasons I don't entirely understand because as time goes on, he really just seems like more and more of a complete douchebag to me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like, okay, so you ran this this campaign and everybody's all hopped up about this one time you were young and you were in a punk band and you skateboarded. And I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> whoop de freaking do, you're a Gen Xer. Congratulations. Right. <laughs> you're everyone I went yeah, to high school like, with. Congrats. <laughs> great. You're a white man in your late 40s. Wow, this is wonderful. But then he lost to Ted Cruz, obviously, in a fairly close race. I mean, I, I think it was it was certainly closer than you'd think a Texas Senate yeah, race with a Republican, it was, it was pretty, you know, a somewhat popular. Yeah, Republican it was pretty movie. tight. So his response to losing was apparently to um, go find himself, I suppose, which <laughs> is what we used to call. I shouldn't laugh. Maybe he really is trying to find himself, but there's something about this whole thing that makes me a little cynical. Yeah, it, it's it's. I think it's what we used to call having a midlife crisis. So <laughs> right. he, I, and 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 I, as far as I know, he he didn't. His wife and child were not on this road no, trip. No, so and I just, thought they were. Just said, See you guys. To begin I gotta with. go. Like I thought, like he packed up the whole family and just decided to go wander around Texas. But no, apparently, no. He just got in his <laughs> truck. And left his wife and kids at home to go wander. Brought a film crew, but left the wife and kids. (laughs) I'm going to go talk to real people and I'm going to leave my wife and kids at home and just avoid all my responsibilities because I'm an adult. (laughs) Yeah, it's clear there is some weird narrative being built to try to promote this guy. I'm not saying there's like some deep, dark forces like George Soros secretly funding him, but there's there's some weird concerted effort to make this guy out to be the next sort of uh, every man like Jimmy Carter. I'm just a normal guy, you know, coming to save the day and, you know, I maybe become president. I have to assume with all I've been seeing in the media that he is. I'm not sure if he actually officially announced he was running for president or not, but it seems like that's something that's... Inevitable. Yeah, it seems like it's coming and from what I can judge, it feels really like what the media did with Obama back in 2007, 2008, as far as positioning him as this young, kind of good looking, kind of hip dude who is the future hopey, changey guy. But it, I mean, at least Obama, as thin as his record was, I mean, he did have something to run on. Like he was, 
He was in the state Senate and then he was a senator for like 15 minutes and then he ran for president. Well, and he had a ton of charisma. And I can I can at least recognize that despite all the things I disagree with about Barack Obama on, um, he has charisma. I think that's pretty undeniable. I flipped the channel over to Beto or Beto and I, I do not see anything. Like yeah, that. I mean, Obama. <laughs> I really see a really boring yeah, guy. Obama, for all of his faults, he had it. He had right. he, he had the star power. He had it. And it feels like they're trying to do that with Beto. I, I can't. I can't do the long e. I just keep calling him Beto, and people make fun of me. Let's just call. Well, let's call him Bo. <laughs> let's just call him Robert because that's his name. There you go, Robert Francis O'Rourke, who is not Hispanic. He is white as hell, <laughs> and rich. And yeah, basically, your typical. So, sounds like you're telling him to go to to bed without dinner there. Robert Francis O'Rourke. <laughs> well, I mean, it, like, why does everyone keep trying to make him sound like he's not what he is? But anyway, so I don't I don't understand this. And then there was this whole kind of moment when he was running against Ted Cruz where a lot of women seem to just go really in the bag for him in really creepy ways online that I don't really want to talk about ever, ever, ever again. <laughs> Because there was there was some weird stuff said, but yeah, I don't really know where they're going with this dude. Like, I don't I don't see it. He's he's way too soft for this election. Well, there are a couple candidates out there that I have seen libertarians talking about uh, or getting excited about or interested in. Uh, one of them, of course, that springs to mind is, is someone who I I certainly appreciate them on an issue or two. And that, that's Tulsi Gabbard, uh, just because she is. Maybe the only actual anti-war voice in the entire race. Um, we don't even know who the libertarian candidate is going to be. So maybe literally in the entire race, because I don't think another Democrat really is uh, anti-war in the um, in the steadfast. What do you think about Tulsi Gabbard? Because I do see libertarians that you know talk about maybe I'll donate to her just to get an anti-war voice out there. Uh, obviously, if you flip over to her economic positions, uh, her gun positions, uh, she in no way lines up with libertarians. Uh, but she is very, very good on two very important issues, that being foreign policy and the war on drugs. Really, to me, the most important issues. So I kind of go back and forth on on how much I should speak positively about someone who who's, who many of views of which I will disagree with, but two of her big views and the ones that she could be talking about on a national stage, she is very excellent on. So what's your take on um, maybe just people like that, that candidates or in general or public figures that have a couple of views that are strongly libertarian, but are obviously very bad on other things. I mean, Tulsi to her credit, I mean, she's, she speaks truth to power on the anti-war thing. Like she calls people out on Syria and Saudi Arabia and everything like that. And I, I support that completely, but, her domestic policy is a complete mess. So, I mean, That's it's horrendous. just, oh my God. It's like, can we take your foreign policy and put it in somebody else? But I, I'm fascinated by this. And I've, I've seen people say that about Tulsi. And I've seen people say it about Yang. And I understand it more with Tulsi because of her strident, strident anti-war stance. Like You can tell she means it. Like She actually believes that when she's not just playing around and dabbling with, you know, sort of being anti-war. Like, that's that's kind of how I feel about Bernie. But you can, fe- you can tell she is actually staunchly opposed to American interventions overseas. Yeah, and you can tell she's fairly well-versed in the topic, too. It's not just, like, platitudes. Like, she's calling out specific situations. Especially, right. and she actually, I was watching her on The View the other day, and she was calling out against any kind of U.S. intervention in Venezuela. So, I mean, she she is very well versed on the foreign policy topics. Like I said, just her domestic policy is a mess. Yang, I don't know as much about. And I will totally admit that I've been completely remiss in not listening to the fifth column where Camille interviews Andrew Yang yet. I need to get on that. Because I, from what I understand, they talk about UBI a lot, and I'm very interested in hearing that conversation. Yeah, he's he's basically running a UBI campaign, a inform the public about AI and automation and losing jobs, and that's essentially his his issue. Although he has put out a few statements on other things, such as guns and assault weapon bans and, and the, the kind of things that uh, libertarians would oppose. He's also come out uh, in favor of legalizing marijuana, which 
I, I guess it's a good thing that it doesn't even seem that bold because there are other, you know, obviously Tulsi Gabbard also, also um, you know, is in favor of that. Uh, but I, I almost think the marijuana issue is going to be off the table for for 2020. I, I predict that Donald Trump will in some way uh, at least signal a legalization at the federal level before 2020 just to take that away from the Democrats. But uh, that's neither here nor there. But I think the, the Andrew Yang thing in many ways with libertarians seems to be a combination of – we appreciate this guy's social media game because he does. He is pretty funny, and he does have you know a pretty good way about him on Twitter. And uh, combined with just a straight up troll. <laughs> yeah, and I and what's interesting that I've seen kind of happen in certain corners of libertarianism is there being a discussion of UBI. And for what it's worth, I don't agree with it whatsoever. I do not think it's a good idea. I can see where it's going to go very badly very quickly. But I, I've seen it discussed, and I think that is an area where libertarians are trying to support him on. And I mean, I don't agree with it, but I mean, do you, I guess? But yeah, the stance on guns and uh, again, a lot of his domestic policy is just garbage, just like every other Democratic candidate. All their domestic policies are garbage. Yeah, I mean, they they pretty much all have – essentially the same domestic campaign so to me even even while i disagree with all of the democrats you know positions on those things that's kind of what makes people like tulsi and maybe to some extent yang stand out as well i, I already agree with i already disagree with this whole whole batch of positions but that's the same with everybody so i can kind of put that to the side and then just say okay well they're pretty good on these one or two things maybe that applies to tulsi more than andrew i don't, I don't really know what he's good on other than the marijuana thing yeah, I don't I don't really know much about his foreign policy. As far as marijuana legalization, I think pretty much everybody's on board with that at this point. We're almost to the point where it's I'm not going to say it's not worth bringing up because it is important. I think it is very important to recognize how far we've come with this, but it's almost a mainstream position at this point. So, like we're not we're not the we're not the weird fringe wacko libertarians slash Republicans who just want to get high anymore. Like it's kind of become a mainstream idea that yes, marijuana should be legalized. It should be taken off of schedule one on the federal level. States should have the right to make whatever laws that they wish to make regarding weed. And the one thing that is very interesting to me though, and this is something that I'm starting to see creep in is the decriminalization of prostitution. Oh uh, yeah. That has been a, become a topic in the race. Yeah. Though. And I think, you can kind of tie that to the marijuana legalization slash decriminalization movement as far as people becoming more accepting of the idea that it is everybody's right to do what they want to do with their own body. And there's kind of like coming to this realization of thinking like, okay, why is this illegal again? Like what, why, why, why do we not allow this? The same way that people have kind of come around to weed where people are kind of coming around to the idea that prostitution should be decriminalized. That's, that's, that's the preferred term for sex workers. They prefer decriminalization over legalization. So I will advocate for that on their behalf. So it, that's, that's what's interesting to me because I think that's going to be the one, if there's going to be any kind of pushback between the two, it's going to be on prostitution. Because that, while um, while it's a, a very obvious uh, thing to libertarians, uh, it's obvious that a woman should have agency over her body, and if it's consensual, then there, there's no reason to make it illegal. That is quite not quite breached the mainstream in the way that, say, marijuana marijuana legalization or just even drug decriminalization has. It's still, I think, somewhat of a taboo subject. So I am glad to see it is actually a discussion that's out there. I mean, Tulsa Gabbard has again another good thing she's really good on has strongly come out uh, in favor of decriminalizing. So. So that's an, another point in her favor. So, I mean, I, I do want her on that stage just because, my God, she'll at least make things interesting. Andrew Yang will make things interesting. So uh, I guess there's there's two things here. There's the libertarian of me who's going to disagree with a lot of things. And then there's the just the person who watches politics and the person that finds entertainment value in it. And heck, I guess I even want Beto in there just because he's fun to talk about for, for some strange reason. It's fun to talk about how boring he is, I guess. So I, I guess I'm rooting for everyone to everyone remotely interesting to be involved because I'm going to be doing a lot of podcasts. I'm sure you're going to be talking about this uh, on your podcast quite a bit uh, as the race plays out. So I guess I'm just ultimately rooting for the most entertaining and uh, the best the best amount of libertarian ideas that can possibly work their way into this race because we're not going to have Republican debates. Uh, 
Uh, so really, this is all about the, the, the entire political landscape is going to be filtered through this Democratic primary. So I'm just, I guess, rooting for the most libertarian positions to at least be discussed, at least be put out there. So I, I will silently, in a way, root for anybody who will do that, I guess, to some extent. Yeah, and I, and I don't mind that position either. And I mean, we're going to be doing episode upon episode upon episode of this because we're going to have apparently 50, 11 Democratic debates and do, are you familiar with how they're planning on doing these debates? I heard there was like 20 of them planned. Okay, so here's here's what seems to be the plan right now. I'm scared. The field is so wide and is getting wider by the millisecond. Apparently, they're going to have – It's I think it's at least 10 debates. But what's going to happen is they're going to be like two night events where like half the field debates – each other and then the other half of the field debates each other and i guess there's gonna be some kind of lottery system to figure out who is in like group a and who's in group b and i'm just like maybe you guys should probably run less people maybe don't make the same mistake that republicans made in 2015 can we have primary primaries? Can we can we like whittle the field down uh, in some way before we get to this part? Yeah, like that's that's what I don't understand. Like, what are people going to show up to Democratic primaries and there's going to be like 13, 14 options? Like, what the hell is this? I feel like it's just going to be the debate stage is going to be laid out like Hollywood squares eventually, with just but with more squares, yeah, there, <laughs> just rows and rows of candidates. And yeah, I mean, I do think that this sort of set up kind of allows for what happened in 2015 in the Republican race where kind of the craziest mofo in the room ends up getting the nomination, which means I'm thinking that Bernie might actually end up with it because I don't know how you out Bernie Bernie. I, I If I had to predict today, I would predict Kamala Harris or Kamala Harris only because to me just watching uh, seeing the coverage of her, it seems like she's the one that they they push to the forefront. It seems like she's the one, even on town halls and that kind of thing on CNN, she seems to get softball, uh, tell us how great you are questions, whereas someone like Tulsi Gabbard gets questions that really just make her out like a kook. Like, it's really every every question for Tulsi was, how here's something that makes you seem crazy, how do you respond to it? Whereas... Kamala Harris had an opposite type of situation where it's just, here's a setup to tell us how great you are and how great you are in this thing and how wonderful you are and, uh, you know, all, all that. So that, and, and factor in that I really think it's going to be difficult with the embracing of identity politics. It's really hard for me to picture the Democratic Party nominating an old white man. But see, that, <laughs> that's maybe the cynical that side. That would of be it. hilarious to me. But my, my initial, initial before anybody even announced, anything like i predicted this last year my prediction was warren booker for the ticket in 2020 like elizabeth warren and cory booker which which i can still kind of see happening because this is this is gonna be a bloodbath like this is this is i think i think the dna thing i think warren's dead i think she's dead i think trump murdered her (laughs) dead to rights uh with the whole dna she kind of murdered herself too by just i mean that was just such a self-own like you didn't know he he gave her the news he handed it over and she went okay i'll take this and 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 like once you get the results of those dna tests why do you publicize that I would have just stuck that stuff at like a desk. Probably, possibly one of the dumbest political moves I, I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, like once you find that out, you just like stick it in a desk drawer somewhere and just bury it and just pretend <laughs> like this never happened. Definitely not going to publicize it. Junk mail folder. I mean, I don't know. I don't know who's going to end out on top on this. But when I made that prediction, I was under the assumption that Bernie would not run, would not want to wor- run, would not be entirely welcome to run, which... The welcome part is still kind of up in the air, I think, not not just from this DNC perspective, but as far as the base actually wanting him around. And it's it's really weird to watch people react to various Democratic candidates, especially like on social media, because you've got you've got kind of more centrist people who are trying to yank the party back to the center but then you've got this weird rabid far left contingency that wants to just yank everything far left and it's i don't know who's going to win this argument i know who should win it but i don't know who is going to win it 
Well, I, I know who's going to win it, and that is the fans. The fans of our podcasts, the fans of Lions of Liberty, the fans of Gen the Libertarian, because I know both of our shows are going to be covering this entire mess uh, in various ways as we go along. So uh, I'm a little bit frightened, a little bit intimidated of, of possibly uh, 20 or maybe it's 40 <laughs> or maybe it's 50 debates. Who really knows what it's going to all be? But uh, I'm sure I do encourage people to follow your show because I know you'll be talking about this stuff. And uh, you know maybe we'll have you back somewhere throughout this uh, this process uh, on one of the shows where we're talking about these debates. But uh, before I let you go, Jed, it's been an absolute blast having you on. Why don't you just let everybody know a little bit more about your podcast, uh, the direction you're taking it. I think you're starting to incorporate more interview type stuff, which is pretty cool. And uh, just let everybody know where they can find you on Twitter, where they can find you all over the place. Well, as far as podcast is concerned, it's Jen the Libertarian, and you can find me on iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, Stitcher, YouTube, Spotify, and SoundCloud. Um, I do, I try to do two a week now. I try to do at least one episode that's kind of like a weekly news roundup, and then I try to do another episode that's a little more evergreen, and I am starting to incorporate more interviews and stuff like that. Um, on Twitter, you can find me at Jennifer m underscore q or if you search jen monroe i should come up and those are typically the places you can find me i'm trying to think of anything else i need to mention and i can't really think of anything well if you do i'll include it all in the show notes conveniently for our listeners although i must say if if you guys love us or any of us or me or mark or anybody on lions of liberty or any libertarian who has to cover the 2020 election cycle please send alcohol Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> That's one of the greatest perks of being a podcaster. I actually have been sent alcohol on several occasions from fans, and that that is really the gift that keeps on giving. Well, it doesn't keep on giving. I finish it pretty quickly, but you know what I mean. <laughs> It gives for a while, and that's enough. It gives for a little bit, <laughs> and that is enough. Yeah. Well, Jen, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a blast having you here. I know we've uh, known each other on the Twitterverse for a little while, so it's fi- and, uh, always fun to finally, uh, I guess, meet on the internet in, uh, in voice form. So uh, keep up the great work, Jen, and keep on roaring. Thanks, man. All right, friends, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Jen, the Libertarian. It is always great connecting with other Libertarian podcasters out there, and she's somebody we'll definitely look to be having back on sometime down the road as we cover the 20 million or so Democratic debates that are coming our way. One thing I do want to mention to you guys before we sign off, I want you to stop whatever you're doing right now and head over to another podcast called The System is Down. This is a show hosted by Dan Smots, who was on this show just a few weeks ago, back in episode 393. You can, of course, hit that by checking back in your podcast feed or going over to lionsofliberty.com slash 393. He is the host of that program, and he does a segment called Tripartisan Triggering, uh, where it's myself representing libertarians, a Democrat, and a Republican. And in this special episode that I want you all to go download and listen to is where I attempt to defend the ideas of libertarianism against uh, the ideas of, uh, well, the other two counterparts. And it's not a debate. It's a very informal chat, a great conversation, as as we always have on these segments. But I really am looking for your feedback on this one because it's not that often often that I actually debate these ideas in sort of a public way. Most of my actual debates have been uh, in private, and, and it's really only now that I'm getting out there and, uh, and trying to get myself out there anyway and have more of these sort of conversations defending the ideas in a more public way. And that certainly is a new skill than doing so with your friends, doing so with people who already sort of agree with you, or doing so in private. So I really am looking for your feedback. Again, it is The System is Down. You can find it, of course, on any and all podcatchers out there over at tsidpod.com and hit subscribe while you're there. It's a great show, somewhat inspired by this program as well. So big shout out to Dan Smuts for putting that together. Be sure to check out The System is Down. It should be released today. If you're listening to this podcast on Monday when it's dropped, you're already able to go hit up that show. And you can send me that feedback. Of course, if you're in the Lions of Liberty Pride, if you're one of our Patreon supporters, you can do that in our private secret Facebook group, the Lions of Liberty Pride Facebook group. We also do have a public Facebook group, the Lions of Liberty Forum. You can come on in there just by searching Lions of Liberty Forum on Facebook. You can also uh, hit me up on Twitter at Mark M-A-R-C, letter D, C-L-A-I-R, at Mark D. Claire, or on the Lions of Liberty Twitter, at Lions of Liberty. Or you can just drop me a personal email if you like, M-A-R-C at lionsofliberty.com. I really am looking to get your feedback. Uh, I think I did a lot of things well, and I think I did a lot of things, you know, not so great. So, you know, I will leave it for you guys to decide and pass judgment upon me. Um, But that is all. Be sure to check out that podcast. I would love to hear your feedback.
And again, today's episode of Lions of Liberty has been brought to you by MathBot.com. The pen may be mightier than the sword, but my friends, code is even mightier than the pen. So learn how to build the tools that will bring prosperity and freedom to the world and learn how to code over at MathBot.com. Once again, that is MathBot.com. Become mighty, my friends. And until next time, live long and live free.